If you want to develop a truly successful career as a software engineer, you have to drive impact at your company. In this video, I'm going to share with you an excerpt from our program, Career Developer Blueprint, which will show you exactly how to have an asymmetric impact and make a real difference in your role. In this lesson, I'm going to show you how to create an asymmetric impact at your company. This is something that's going to allow you to move towards being a 10x developer. Because remember in the last lesson, we said that a 10x developer leverages the skills that they have to create a disproportionate or asymmetric impact at their company. Right? This is a really important tool because you already have a lot of skills that you can use. And the best way that you can start creating more impact at your company is to better apply the skills that you already have. We will in the next module talk about learning new skills, but that's going to be much more time consuming versus if we can better apply the existing skills that we have, that's the best way for us to quickly create more impact. So you can think of your skills as a simple formula. Your skills break down into leverage and depth. That means that how you leverage the skills, how you actually apply those skills, and then the depth of knowledge that you have about each one of those skills. In this module, we're gonna focus on the leverage part. And in the next module, we'll focus on depth and developing new skills. Now, when we talk about leverage, leverage is really using skills to their maximum advantage. By focusing on strategic areas, we can use relatively less effort to drive large impact. We can create an asymmetric impact given the amount of effort that we put in. Let's look at a real world example of what this looks like. Back in 2011, Google was not the player that it was today, but it was still a really dominant force. For example, they had just launched their image search product and their AdSense revenue was approaching $3 billion a year. But 2011 was also the year a little search engine that no one had ever heard of decided to plant its flag. And that startup was DuckDuckGo. It went after Google, which was literally the best search engine ever, and it actually thrived. DuckDuckGo has done over a billion searches in a month, integrates with Safari and Firefox. And how do they do it? Right? How did they survive? How did they actually thrive in a market that was already so saturated, where there was already such a dominant player? The key was that they picked a small niche of the market, which was privacy, and they focused on that. What we can learn from this strategy is becoming the 1% in technical skills is one way to become a 10x developer. Right? We could become the top 1% at everything, but it's not the only way. Instead, we can optimize our leverage by focusing on a specific niche. If we really narrow down and say, I'm going to become the best at this one particular thing, that is a really great way for us to actually hold our own. Today, Google has a market cap of over a trillion dollars, and yet DuckDuckGo manages to hold its own because they focus so much on privacy. That's one thing that Google just doesn't do and they don't really care to do. But DuckDuckGo has been very successful because they said, we're not going to try and do everything. We're not going to try and compete directly with Google on all fronts. We're going to compete with them on this one specific thing. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do in your career. We're going to use the DuckDuckGo strategy of niching down and getting really specific and apply it to our own careers. Here's what the strategy looks like in three steps. And I'll walk you through some examples as well. Number one, we have to identify unmet needs at our company or on our team. At every company, at every stage, there are hundreds, if not thousands of unmet needs. If this is the first time you've thought about finding unmet needs, you might be immediately saying like, I have no idea what those unmet needs are. But I promise you that your company has unmet needs that you'll be able to start spotting. It just takes some work to actually see them. And once you do, you're gonna start seeing them everywhere. This is really an example of what's called the Bader-Meinhof effect or more commonly called the frequency illusion. When people purchase a new car, it often seems like all of a sudden, everyone seems to own that same car. They start seeing them everywhere. And similarly, once you start looking for unmet needs, you'll start to see them everywhere. It's that idea of starting to be aware. If you start developing that awareness, you're gonna start identifying unmet needs all throughout the company that you could potentially help to solve. Here are some simple strategies that you can use to uncover unmet needs. The first might sound really obvious, but you can ask people, what are your biggest roadblocks this week? What have you been struggling with? What annoys you? Right? If you ask people these questions, people love to rant or vent about the things that are bothering them. And this is a really easy way to uncover unmet needs that people are struggling with. You can also just let people complain. 
Listen to the things that people complain about. We love to complain. So if you start actively listening as people are complaining, think about what is the unmet need? Is there a way that I could solve this problem? Also, never assume that a problem just is the way it is. All problems are waiting to be solved. Now, some problems might be much harder to solve than others. And so there may be some problems where you're like, this is too much. I don't want to deal with this. But all problems can have solutions. You just need to acknowledge that just because a problem has always been there or has always been a certain way doesn't mean that there's not a solution to this problem. So let's start with a simple example here. Let's say that your team doesn't have a data analyst to help you parse through how users are behaving with a dashboard on your web app, right? The unmet need here is that we need a data analyst. And now let's move to the second step of the DuckDuckGo strategy, which is to identify your leverageable skills that are skills that you are good at and wouldn't require a huge lift. So what are the things that you are already good at? Because remember, our goal here is not to learn lots of new skills. It's to take the skills that we already have and apply them. So here's an example of a skill that you might have. Maybe you're excellent at SQL. You might not love being knee deep in databases and joining tables, but you're pretty good and by far the best person on your team. So you could offer to chip in a few hours to parse through the data and maybe set up a few dashboards that enable the rest of the team to make data-driven decisions. Now, the final step is that you drive results that have asymmetric impact. So your work leads to this because you are using your skills that you have to enable the team to do the thing that it's trying to do. This is creating leverage because you're using your existing skills and a few hours of your time to do something that is making your team's life a lot easier. So we combine those unmet needs with our skills to create a niche for ourselves. And in this case, that niche might be something like a data-driven engineer, right? We are combining that need for a data analyst with our existing SQL skills to provide a lot of value to our team. And the best part of this is that when we do this, this feeds back into creating opportunities and discovering allies, right? It feeds back into optionality because now we've created more impact that allows us to improve our resume, improve our LinkedIn profile, to connect with new people, to develop stronger relationships that ultimately lead to us then being able to find better opportunities that allow us to leverage these skills even more. So it becomes this very virtuous, almost flywheel-like cycle that is self-reinforcing. And why does the DuckDuckGo strategy work so well? Well, you're starting with a real world problem, right? You're starting with something that people are actually struggling with. One of the classic mistakes that people make in business is that they build a product because they're like, this sounds cool, and then no one actually buys it. And the reason why that happens is that they started with the solution and they didn't start with the problem. So in this case, because we're starting with the problem, we know that it's something that if we solved it would make people's lives better. Then we're strategically and effectively using our existing skills. We're not learning not lots of new skills. There's not a huge lift here. We're able to create a large impact without having to learn lots of new stuff. And that allows us to drive that impact for the team and the organization. And finally, as I said, this creates inputs for your opportunities and your networking, discovering new allies that are going to reinforce each other to make this all stronger and to allow you to double down and really carve out this niche for yourself. So let's look at a couple more examples of this. Here's an example from one of my old jobs. When we had bug reports that would come in, they had to be manually routed to the team that they were relevant to. Because the non-technical staff didn't actually know which team was working on which project. So there was actually one of the engineering teams that managed a lot of the ops stuff that had to go through manually and look at every ticket and determine which team it went to. However, of course, this was taking a lot of time because we had lots of tickets coming in and one person was interested in exploring machine learning. So what they did is, as just a side project, they used TensorFlow to create an automated ticket routing service for the bug reports. And with very little work, they created this automated routing that was about 80% accurate. This saved a ton of time on the team and it's a really simple example of looking at what is a problem that we're experiencing, what is something that I'm interested in or something that I wanna learn more about and how can I leverage that to create a valuable tool. Here's a similar example. Maybe the unmet need at a company is that you're on a team working on acquisition for a cloud gaming service. Your challenge is that you have to stitch together lots of data from different services like Google Analytics, Looker, Amplitude and the team needs a single dashboard where they can see all this data. You're good at writing scripts to import data and building tools, and so your niche might be the internal tooling engineer. 
This could feed back into potential narratives by saying something like, built custom tooling with languages that improved our multi-touch attribution, directly enabled team to 2x customer lifetime value. Right, that's a simple example of something where we took an unmet need, we took a skill or something that we were interested in, and we combined them to create a large impact. Another example from my personal experience was that we were building a tool that was made up of a lot of microservices. Different teams were working on different microservices, and so it was really hard to actually spin everything up because you didn't know which services were required to run which other services. At the time, there was just a bunch of documentation where it was like, okay, for this service, you need A, B, C, and D. For this service, you need D, C, E, and F, and et cetera, et cetera. So actually running any service was a lot of work. A colleague of mine decided that he wanted to build some tools. He was interested in learning more about tooling. And so he just created a simple tool that would allow us to run all of the services. And what it did was it took in a config file that where each team could define what services are needed to run what other service. And by building this tool out, it made it really easy for everyone on the entire engineering team to run whatever service it was that they were trying to run. This was something that he was just interested in. He wanted to try and see if he could do it. And it had a huge impact on the company because now that is the tool of choice for everyone when they are trying to run different services. Here's one more example that doesn't even involve programming skills specifically. In this example, let's consider a company that just closed a series D and is rapidly growing, but there's little documentation or shared knowledge base, right? We've probably all worked at places where the documentation is iffy at best. If you're an excellent communicator and you don't mind writing documentation, you could start spending a couple hours a day documenting processes. You could volunteer to be part of onboarding for new engineers, and this allows you to create a niche of the idea spreading engineer. You're the person who helps improve communications, makes sure that people understand what's going on within the organization, and really makes everyone's lives a lot more efficient. This feeds back into potential narratives by saying something like, develop internal processes and communication to facilitate interdepartmental whatever communication that you did. Right, very simple way that you could build this into your resume, build this into your LinkedIn profile. And then if a company is in the situation where they're looking for someone to help bring clarity to their organization, you are the no brainer choice. Now, before we wrap up this lesson, I wanna just reiterate that there are always unmet needs. And when it comes to finding unmet needs, it's really about looking in the right places. Remember, you can talk to people, listen to people complain, keep an ear to the ground and just hear what is go coming through the grapevine. Don't assume that problems just are. Some more examples of things that might be problems are technical implications or business strategy, system design, testing, implementing an experimentation framework, prototyping, mobile dev. These are all areas in which there might be problems that you could potentially solve. And I know that there are also some common blockers for actually implementing the DuckDuckGo strategy. So I wanna address some of these directly. First of all, I don't have time to do more. Maybe, maybe not. Remember our table stakes here. Remember what we talked about in the last module where we need to focus on the things that we have control over. You could work more, but what else could you do? Could you delegate? Could you get buy-in to work on these other projects? Can you get increased priority? Could you shift how you are focusing your time on different things? There are lots of ways that you could identify more time within your job. I don't wanna be pigeonholed. This is probably one of the things that I hear most commonly but remember, most people who worry about being pigeonholed aren't actually remembered for anything. You can always expand your niche. Uber started out with black cars and now they're in transportation in general. And they even do stuff like food delivery. LeBron was a basketball player. Now he's an investor, an activist, and more. Taylor Swift was a country singer and now she's a pop star. You can start in that niche and branch out, but you have to develop a strong base first. You have to develop yourself strongly within that niche, and then once you do that, it's much easier to expand out. But I'm not world-class at X. Here's the thing with this. You don't have to be world-class. You just have to be proficient, and you have to be the person on your team that is best suited for whatever it is. Remember that your team itself is gonna be fairly small. So you don't have to be amazing at something. You just have to be the person who's identifying those opportunities and actually solving the problems. My company won't let me do X. Admittedly, there are certain industries where it's very difficult to tackle unmet problems. For example, insurance, banking, anything to do with state or federal agencies. There's lots of regulation. They're very conservative in the way that they approach things. And so directly within the company, you may be limited in what you can do. 
However, as best as you can, you got to keep ideating on unmet needs and building trust by solving them. Start with really small stuff. If it's a big, if it's a very conservative company where they don't want to let you do big things, start with things that are really small that you can do. There's some level at which you have ownership. And so find that level and start from there and work your way up. To summarize this lesson, we're going to use the DuckDuckGo strategy to create that asymmetric impact. And that follows three steps. One, we identify unmet needs at the company or on the team. Two, we identify your leverageable skills. And three, we drive results that have asymmetric impact. 